Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I discuss do-it-yourself projects with America's favorite babysitter, Aunt Lindsay of the Fab Lab, and that's what I wanted to highlight today, DIY. What is DIY? Why is it so popular? And how a DIY project can be turned into a business. First, what is DIY? Well, it is a bit self-explanatory, an activity of decorating, building, or making repairs at home by oneself rather than employing a professional. Now, I personally feel the keyword oneself is arbitrary. Personally, I do not believe it means someone cannot have a friend help, preferably with a few beers, during a project, but the intent of DIY is doing it from scratch. No, going to Ikea and purchasing a dresser and assembling the pre-sorted pieces is not considered DIY. But honestly, sometimes it should be because piecing together ready-to-be-assembled furniture reminds me of running up a hill on a slip and slide. Every time I take two steps forward, I realize I did it wrong and fall back. Oh no, my friends, this is strapping on the tool belt that may consist of a hammer, a paintbrush, glue, nail, teethers, trinkets of glitters. My goodness, I can feel my creativity juices flowing already. According to the NIC.com, some people use DIY as a healthy way to escape from stress in everyday life. They tap into creativity they didn't even know they possessed. It reminds me of my undergrad at Portland Community College. In fact, shout out to Lance Payne, who taught me so much about art. First, a brief background of why I began college, which relates to why I chose my degree. First, a former mentor believed in me and encouraged me to be more. Two, I wanted to learn how to run a successful business after my failed clothing line. As I mentioned, my clothing line was basically drawing designs and screen printing them on shirts. However, I sucked at drawing. I mean, I am really, really bad at it. My first design was a legit self-portrait stick figure of just my face. Honestly, how did this business model fail? Nonetheless, I attended undergrad to pursue a Bachelor's of Art in Business Management and Leadership, which led me to take art classes, full circle, During that time, art really became an avenue to escape reality for a moment. Even though art may be a realistic object, for example, the Fab Lab teaches how to make ice cream and non-toxic Play-Doh or gives out lessons about who really invented the light bulb, DIY has become quite popular. How popular? According to a DIY consumer market trend report by Venvio, a digital marketing consulting firm, every generation is DIYing. Age groups that compromise DIYers? Ages 21 to 30, 24%. Ages 31 to 40, 36%. Ages 51 to 60, 19%. And ages 61 to 70 are 16%. All others, 15%. Over a quarter of the individuals aged 21 through 60 are doing DIY projects. That is incredible. But let's go a little bit further. Why is DIY so popular? First, let's discuss when it got popular which was back in the 1950s, according to Wikipedia. So honestly, who knows, really? I cannot say exactly why DIY is popular, but here is a list of a few benefits that have been mentioned by others. First, a deeper appreciation. When taking the time to create a piece, there is a deep appreciation for the time dedicated to making it and the finished project. Another one, brain exercise. As humans, the sense of reward that we get from making something that cannot be purchased or earned in any other way is a joyful experience for many. It is a release of dopamine and serotonin, which is literally your body making joy. Not only that, but you're learning how to make something new. Another thing, connection to others. When I think of DIYers, I think of Etsy, OfferUp, Farmer's Market, where a creator can sell their goods, meet new people, and connect with others. DIY is a whole community unto itself that can provide a certain degree of freedom. Lastly, revenue. There are so many ways to make money selling DIY projects, creating DIY videos, or training courses. The possibilities are endless. Personally, I felt my clothing line was more of a DIY project than an actual company. And there are so many markets that welcome DIY projects and turn it into a startup company. Homemade jewelry, creating gifts and subscription boxes, making candles or makeup, the list goes on. If taking a DIY project and turning it into a business is something of interest to you, it is highly recommended that the entrepreneur do their due diligence when researching the market. Identify competitors, consumers, fulfillment companies like Printful, Amazon, Lulu Express, and others. It will take some time, but just remember all the benefits of doing a DIY project. Boost in brain power, self-discovery, 
richer relationships, and the DIYer may find a newfound confidence. The satisfaction of completing a project and admiring it once it's completed is quite fulfilling. But don't take my word for it. Go out and complete a DIY project. Who knows? It may become the next big business idea. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest was named Portland Business Journal 40 Under 40 in 2019 and honored with the 2021 American Express Founder of Chain Board. She is the award-winning creator and host of the Fab Lab with Crazy Aunt Lindsay. Please welcome Lindsay Murphy. Today, I am here with the founder of the Fab Lab, Aunt Lindsay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Gabriel? Uh, Thank you so much for joining the show. I'm so excited because this is very super educational what you're doing and it's focused on kids. I'm a new father, so I'm really excited to kind of hear about your business. But first, let's get a quick introduction. Tell me, who is Aunt Lindsay? Yeah, Aunt Lindsay is America's favorite babysitter. Tell me more. You know, Aunt Lindsay is a really fun personality presence. I'm a human being. You know, Aunt Lindsay didn't just pull out a hat. I was born uh, into a family with lots of kids and my brother and I are the youngest two by six and eight years. My oldest sibling is maybe 25 years older than I am. So I was an aunt before I was fully aware of the world and sort of stepping into that as I got older, leading a career in advertising and business development for a brief time to take care of people's children. You know, parents would say, oh, you know, Miss Lindsay or Lindsay. And I come from a fairly traditional background and it always felt a little uncomfortable to have kids call me by my first name. <laughs> so I would say, you know what, don't call me Miss Lindsay. I'm, I'm not quite there yet as an early 20-something. <laughs> Just have them call me Aunt Lindsay. Like <laughs> and, it. It, and it sucks. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the Fab Lab. What is it? What does it do? How did we start it? Let's, let's talk about it. First, what is the Fab Lab? Yeah, the Fab Lab is the home of the most fabulous DIY science projects that have ever existed. What I do is I take everyday science concepts and I turn them into fabulous DIY projects that kids can do at home with their families, share with their friends. It really is about bringing science into the home, into the lives of kids, because science, technology, engineering, and math, whether we know we're doing it or not, it's there. We're doing it. We're interacting with it. We're using it. Uh, You know, it makes our lives fuller, easier, more interesting. How did you kind of start? So it's record these science projects, right? And then you put them on YouTube. How did you kind of go about starting Mm -hmm. it? So uh, I sort of briefly mentioned in my intro, I was in my career really early. I was 16 at the Fashion Institute of Technology, which is a college. I was interning. Well, I was at FIT at 15, interning at 16. And by the time I was graduating from community college at 19, I had been offered a job at MTV Network to build out video on demand. I mean, years before on-demand content was really a thing. So it was just me and my like teenage 20-year-old self in an edit suite with uh, my colleague, Sabrina, building out the infrastructure systems and protocol for 
for digital content development. I had no idea what we were doing or how <laughs> far uh, it would grow, uh, you know, all those years ago. We're talking, you know, 2005, I set foot at, in MTV wow. Network. And fast forward about five, six years, I was named Director of Business Development at an advertising agency. And by 26, I was completely burned out. And so I took a break uh, from my very serious corporate career and took care of people's children uh, to make ends meet. And it was in that season of my life that I discovered the calling on my life, which was being a part of people's families and helping to support children discover the world around them, and more importantly, discover themselves. And at the end of 18 months, I was presented with the opportunity to take this really awesome consulting job with Xbox launching Connect, and it would take me away from my the town that I had been living in at the time uh, for about nine months. And so I closed up shop, and before I did that, a couple of families got together, threw me a going-away party, and one of the parents came up and said, you know, hey, have you ever heard of YouTube? Granted, this is, you know, 2008, 2009, right? Mm -hmm. Totally viable question. Have you heard of YouTube? <laughs> and yes, of course, I'd heard of YouTube. And that parent said, hey, you know, you should make videos of the projects and the activities and experiences mm -hmm. that you created for our children with our children be such a great way to keep in touch because we're going to miss you. And, you know, about a year later, I'm sitting in the Outer Banks on family vacation suddenly a consultant, didn't have a job, wasn't sure what I was going to do next, and I panicked. Uh, and my first thought was, go back to babysitting, go back to babysitting. Uh, and so I called a friend, just sort of taking a cue from the suggestion of one of the parents at that going away party. I called my friend Tyrion, who I knew from working at Nickelodeon. And I said, hey, will you come out to Jersey? And uh, New Jersey, that's my home state. Of course, Oregon is my home state now, but I'm, you know, born and raised in New Jersey. You know, will you come out, you know, just record me making this, making Play-Doh with my goddaughter? Mm -hmm. He said, sure. He came out, recorded me. A week later, he sent me a file that I was truly expecting to just be a home video if you can rewind in your mind, you know, back to 2008, 2009, 2010. You know, YouTube was really only getting started. It wasn't truly a part of the zeitgeist just yet. And a lot of the content that was on YouTube at the time was very, you know, ad hoc, very raw, uh, yeah. you know, very not not nearly as glossy. As Early day now, YouTube, right? man. That was uh, wild, wild west. Uh, ooh, <laughs> wild, wild west, right? And I was expecting a home video. That was all I was expecting. I had never, you know, I didn't even own a camera at the time. I had, because of the job that I'd worked at Xbox, I received my first digital camera, which was, oh gosh, what is that called? Uh, oh gosh, it's, oh goodness, what is that thing called? A flip cam. Oh, uh, I remember those cam, things. I remember those flip cams. Do you, the, those things were <laughs> Totally. They were great. <laughs> you know, they were yeah. amazing. Yes. But they became completely obsolete. They did. Like, very, two fast, years very fast. Very fast. Because the I yeah the iPhone got born right yeah. the iPhone got born in this time and you know very quickly the iPhone and other smartphones built camera functions mm -hmm. uh, but this was my first camera I'd never had a camera before I'd never had a camera uh, before that I had only gotten my first personal computer maybe two years or the year before that. And so I was expecting a home video. And what I opened was this beautifully edited thing. It had music and it had text. And I had never seen myself in that capacity before. I've never really seen myself before. Again, this is before Instagram, before TikTok, right? So, you know, we weren't used to seeing ourselves on film unless you were a public personality that was in that world. And so when I saw this, just all of these light bulbs went off memories of my childhood dreams of being the first ever kids cooking show host flooded through my body <laughs> and I was like oh my gosh this is happening love it uh, I love it and yeah truly so uh, you know I saw this video I emailed it out to the 11 person email list of parents I used to babysit for and I was just like hey you know here's a video of me baby of me you know making play-doh and p.s. I'm available for babysitting if you ever need it and right away my calendar got totally booked out for about three months oh wow and the interesting thing that happened is, you know, maybe the day before or a couple of days before uh, my scheduled babysitting job, I get this phone call back when we dialed phone numbers and talked on the phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what happens in a decade, I tell you. I'm telling you, um, it's been crazy. You know, I, I, I get this phone.
phone call and it's a parent, hey, you know, Johnny wants to, you know, wants to talk to you. Okay, you know, hey, Johnny, what's up? You know, hey, Aunt Lindsay, I, you know, heard you're going to come over tomorrow. Yep, I'll be there at, you know, five o'clock or six o'clock. Okay, cool. Are we going to make a video like the one on YouTube? And I'm like, yeah, we're going to make a video. Of course. What do you want to make a video about? And so I would, you know, the first season, first real season, the first actually two or three seasons of the show, I was actively babysitting. Like I'm actively in the homes of children, babysitting, (laughs) just doing whatever to occupy, you know, the times and, you know, busy minds of, of kids. And, you know, oftentimes it was, you know, the slightly older sibling or the, you know, teenage neighbor who I, you know, sort of coerce over with snacks and, you know, promise of TV time or whatever, you know, holding the camera, uh, you know, th- those are my first production assistants. To this day, my Fab Lab professors, the kids that I have co-hosting the show awesome. are kids it. in my life. They're actual kids in my life. Nieces, nephews. Now um, I have a wonderful community of friends here in Portland who've got amazing kids who would just have these amazing electric little personalities. And so, you know, I've never worked with any professional children or, you know, and only in the last couple of years, I've truly stepped into making it a business. But, you know, just that element of surprise and awe and learning together and discovering Mm -hmm. in real time, it's all, it's all there. You know, I think kids can tell when you're faking it. And, you know, this show really holds precious, you know, just really honors that very special time in a kid's life. And for kids out there that have no siblings or, you know, especially during the global health effort that we just Mm -hmm. went through together, uh, you know, with isolation, you know, these are kids friends, you know, these are, these are the virtual friends and the virtual relationships that we get to have with each other. So that's how it got started. That's awesome. You know, one thing too, uh, you know, for the listeners at home that you just kind of pointed out is kids can do some amazing things. You know, if you you give them an opportunity, if you believe in a child, even an adult, right? Just believe in somebody. It's amazing what somebody can do if they're believed in. But now I got to take it. I got to take a step back. I know we're here to talk about the Fab Lab, but you were in college at 16. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Tell me more. How did this happen? Let's let's talk about that. How did that how did that happen? I was actually in college at 15. First time I applied to FIT, I was 12 years old. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> um, yes. Back when back when teen magazines had college applications mm. tucked into them. Shout out to teen magazine. <laughs> um, Way to do it. Right, right, right. I was a kid. I didn't really like school. I wasn't super interested in what, you know, what we were doing every day. It was really boring and dry. And you can kind of tell when your teachers are really passionate about what they're teaching. Those were the super fun classes. But then you can also really tell when teachers are kind of tired or when they're just teaching from a textbook and don't really aren't really interested in what they're offering, aren't really interested in what they're teaching. And I just found that so many teachers that I experienced, you know, that was how they approached it. And so Mm -hmm. I was a very disengaged student. But my sister, Hillary, who is eight years older than I am, she went to college when I was around 10. When she came home from uh, college her first semester, you know, backpack full of Harper's Bazaar, Vogue magazine, all these high fashion magazines. And I just fell in absolute love. And I decided that I wanted to work in magazines. I decided at, you know, 10, 12 years old, I'm going to be Ann Wintour. I'm going to be Andre Leon Holly's best friend. I'm going to be, you know, editor in chief of, you know, Vogue magazine. That's the life I'm going to live. And I would just devour every fashion magazine. There was a channel called Metro, a New York City channel called Metro that would stream, live stream fashion week from France. Um, nice. New York, of course, I, I think also Italy, um, maybe one or two other fashion weeks. I can't remember, but those were the three main ones. And I would like write little write ups about like not a fashion blog, but I would just like write little fashion stories about the trends that I was seeing or what hit the runway. Uh, and so when I saw a fashion institute of technology application in one of my teen magazines, I filled it out. You know, I, I got, you know, I think 12 or $15 from my mom, a money order. I mailed it in with this essay, uh, you know, explaining why I thought I was ready for college and how in love of fashion I was, um, basically begging them to let me into college, you know, at 12. And <laughs> a few weeks later, I get an official letterhead response <laughs> with my money order in the envelope, with my returned money order, I will note that it was just, you know, thank you so much for applying. You know, unfortunately, you know, you have to, you know, graduate high school and have an SAT and transcript and all of these other things that I just didn't have yet. Um, mm-hmm. But they did inform me that they had a program for high school students that I could apply for when I got to high school. So my 
I think my sophomore year, I applied, I got into the summer program. My mom made me get a summer job and I, <laughs> I literally paid for myself to go uh, to FIT summers and Saturdays. Yeah, all throughout high school. And by the time I was 15, you know, I had enough, you know, mentors and friends in that industry who were able to give me an internship. So I was in, you know, a mid fashion, uh, mid range fashion showroom learning about buying, learning about materials, learning about sales at 16. So you've, you've just been an entrepreneur since birth. <laughs> I was, you know, I'll, I'll say I was just really interested. You know, when you, oh, when God. you're, when you're interested in something, now we have the profound luxury and privilege of Google, right? Mm, Search. We yeah. have an entire internet full of very well categorized content. Yeah, that wasn't really a thing back then. You used to have to go through very traditional channels of learning the information you were hungry for. And if you didn't have, you know, immediate access to those things, you were kind of just lost. Yeah. And funny, I, I don't know that I ever really identified with the term entrepreneur, because to me, I have my own ideas of what an entrepreneur actually is. But I was just really interested in things. And I wasn't afraid, or at least I wasn't ever discouraged by my family from finding the pathways down whatever rabbit hole I found myself going down, you know, where my parents maybe didn't fully understand what I was into or what I was doing. You know, they were so busy that it was like, oh, you're in a safe place. Okay, go for it. You know, <laughs> oh, you're having a good time. Yeah. Cool. And so it was really just about indulging my interests from a really early age, being resourced to do so, uh, and then letting that journey unfurl itself on its own. Over the years, as I've stepped into the startup community in Portland and become a bit of a public personality giving talks and things, I, I realized that I come from a family. I come from a history of entrepreneurs. Uh, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, rather, they didn't call it entrepreneurship then, but, you know, when rent is due, <laughs> you know, when the mortgage is due, <laughs> yeah. uh, you yeah. know, when, when taxes are due, and you don't have enough from whatever your day job is, mm -hmm. it's the fish fry in the back of the yeah. house. You know, yeah. you invite them neighbors over, you charge $5 a plate, you, you know, you do the hair on, in the front yard. You know, my mom worked in the legal profession for all of her life. And she was a seamstress on the side making wedding dresses and prom dresses. And so there was always that side hustle mentality. There was yeah. always that, what do we have to give so that we can get what we need if we don't have enough? And so I think in a way, yes, I was sort of born into entrepreneurship. My great grandfather, my great grandmother's husband owned a taxi business. I think the first taxi business and certainly first black owned in my hometown. You know, they owned multiple properties for a significant portion of time. So yeah. there was always a lot of income streams. There were always a lot of things to do and a lot of busyness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things you're, you're kind of talking about is being creative as a kid and having that opportunity to be creative. You know, and that's also one mm -hmm. of the things now you're kind of helping support, right? Is kids creativity. How important is that? Because you're you're taking care of kids, right? And I think so often we tend to tell people to, you know, hey, grow up, right? And like, no, be creative, be be innovative. How important <laughs> is that for you or from your perspective? How important is creativity? You know, my favorite song <laughs> that I sing pretty like almost daily, and I just <laughs> I'll tell you an anecdote in just a second. You know, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. Oh you know? man, it's a classic. Uh, so it's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> and and I often say, eight-year-old Lindsay is the creative director of the Fab Lab. I never grew up. Uh, and that's not to say that I didn't get older and learn and grow and enter into adulthood. But my heart and my spirit has always been, I've just always insisted on maintaining that sort of surprise and delight of discovery. I will never know everything. And the discovery of the things that I'm interested in, instead of Fearing what I don't know, mm -hmm. let me lean into what I can find out. I do a lot of work in my other life. You know, I've got the Fab Lab Crazy Aunt Lindsay, but I have, you know, a number of other businesses and activities. And many of them are centered around helping adults to oh, reconnect with their child self. You know, something mm -hmm. happens to us around the age of eight. I've given a talk about this at World Domination. You know, something happens to us around eight where we begin to believe what the world 
says about us. Mm, uh, we begin so to believe that external validation is the most important thing. And we begin to change ourselves to acquire that external validation, to be called good, to be called smart, to be, you know, to become successful. And we abandon or hide or in some cases even sever these incredibly natural, magical parts of ourselves that we are born with, that the world needs, that our hearts need, that our minds need that our spirits need, that this world needs. Anyone that's been to therapy, right? Anyone that's been to therapy (laughs) knows, you know, we're all just healing past what happened to us as as children. My whole life is dedicated to speaking to, nourishing, nurturing, developing the child in all of us. Mm -hmm. And even the Fab Lab, you know, it's intentionally about the relationship between adult and child. And it doesn't matter if it's a parent and their child, if it's uh, an aunt and uncle and their niece and nephew, grandparents, teachers, child care providers, kids need engagement. They are sponges. They're sponges. Uh, And so for me, and interestingly, part of how I began to develop projects and activities when I was a babysitter is that I just had this odd qualm with plopping children down in front of a screen Mm -hmm. to just, you know, leave them to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's not to say that there is not a lot of wonderful TV shows and content out there that are good for kids, Mm -hmm. but so much of it isn't. Uh, You know, the history of children's television has always been steeped in selling products. Right. Mm -hmm. I come from advertising and marketing. And again, I had an amazing professor, Ray Kalis at County College of Morris, who himself was a media historian. Television, it's an incredible disseminator of information the same way the Internet is. But, you know, we live in in a capitalistic world where, you know, you know, cash is king and yeah. everything is in an effort to sell something. So you're not always going to get things packaged or you're not always going to get things that are packaged in the most nourishing, truthful, meaningful way. So to me, when I was a child care provider, I never wanted to just keep a kid in front of a TV, yeah. you know, let them, you know, gobble up commercials, gobble up as a person who loves commercials, mind you, right? I love commercials <laughs> and advertising. I cannot stress that enough. But, you know, I really wanted to take as full advantage of the short amount of time that I had with those kids. Sometimes it was just an hour. You know, other times it was half a day. You know, sometimes it was a couple of days if, you know, parents were on long business trips. Yeah. What can I do in this short period of time that could possibly, possibly have lasting impact, positive impact on this kid's sense of self and their understanding of the world around them? Yeah, that, and that's so important because I think what you were discussing too is you, you begin to believe what people tell you are, right? And that oh, takes yeah. a long time. You know, it, it took me years to, you know, when I moved out of my old community, I was, I was this person, Right. And as I grew into an adult, I realized, no, that's not who I am. What your perception of my reality is not my reality, right? And it takes a long time. And, and we kind of discussed it earlier in this episode too, of it's amazing what people will do when somebody else believes in you kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. and these kids creativity, even young adults creativity and older adults creativity is so important to really maintain and hold on to because that really is the the catalyst to innovation, Right having the creativity oh, sure. juices and feeling confident to go out there and be creative and, and make something right now. One of the yeah, things creativity and confidence, creativity and confidence go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, you know, we are naturally creative, but so many of us, we fear that what we have to create isn't going to look right. It's not going to be liked. Uh, it's not perfect. Yep. It's not going to make money. You know, we're going to look silly for making mistakes or whatever right. it is. It really takes, courage to be created, but it, I cannot stress enough, we are naturally creative and what we were born into this world to give to it are our creations and the world needs those things. Uh, and just to say, I, I just deployed, uh, I just deployed a meme or a quote card rather on my, on my personal Instagram uh, of my own, where I said, yeah, I'm preparing to do a class, so I'm just thinking a, a lot about different things. But, you know, I was eight years old when <laughs> I started yeah. to believe what other people said about me. And I was 36 before I began. to. That's such a great, great take home point. And one of the things you kind of talk about is creating all these new ideas. How do you create these different topics? Because your audience is kids, right? How do you create mm-hmm. new topics? Because one of the things I, I saw you, uh, one of your videos was really cool. Who invented the light bulb, right? Very informative. Mm -hmm. How do you create these new ideas or new topics? Yeah. 
Right. So it's really not hard when you spend time with kids. <laughs> kids <laughs> have a lot of questions. <laughs> That's very true. I, I was the type of kid that just constantly asked questions. I, I was actually put on punishment several times <laughs> for asking too many, or in some cases, asking very inappropriate questions. Uh, but yeah. anywho, so, you know, when you spend time with kids that got questions, I would just intentionally pause to think about their question, to think about where the question was coming from and sort of consider where is this kid right now? You know, as an adult, many adults sort of lose that sense of wonder that comes along with being in this world. I mean, the world is just such a magical and mystical place. I mean, the sun, you know, the stars, grass. I live in a beautiful high rise. I mean, how did we get up that high? All of the inventions that were required Mm. for this building that I live in to be and the different iterations of buildings over a vast history of time. I'm from the East Coast where some of the first, you know, mid and high rise buildings were ever built. The guy that invented the elevator, the, you know, the person that invented window process to get it in there. I mean, all of the different minds over a long period of time that come together and culminate into this one manifestation, right? That I get to just take for granted and living in, right? Mm, And I just complain about how the plumbing is a little weird today, right? No, (laughs) like this is a magic thing like the fact that I'm living in this building the fact that I can type in a couple of words in the internet and half hour later have an entire week's worth of groceries because someone someone else who invented an app who invented the phone you know who invented yeah, the totally. bike who rode himself over here to drop them off I mean it's like it's amazing so one of the things that I do is I think about where the kid is what they know and what they certainly don't and mm. I try to meet them exactly where they are and not approach them as an adult where it's like, oh, you should know this already, or how don't you know this already? Or, you know, you'll figure it out. I try to engage on their level, starting where they are. And so, you know, kids ask a bunch of questions. I still have a ton of questions, uh, specifically coming to the light bulb. I'm from Marstown, New Jersey, just a few steps away from Edison's lab. And I knew from an early age that Thomas Edison didn't actually invent the light bulb. Mm. He owns the patent. It was brought together in his lab and he's attributed to being the inventor. But there were many minds that were working on that light bulb. We often, you know, we say, oh, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Or when we talk about anyone inventing anything, we have this imaginary illusion of them in a dark room toiling away when in fact, these are people that have teams of people who are often working on it. And the person who actually invented the filament that Thomas Edison himself could not figure out how to get right. Louis Latimer, he is the person who figured out how to make the filament burn longer, brighter, and less expensive. The encasement, the person that invented the the glass case, the person that invented the base, and then the person who invented the filament, that is where the light bulb came from. It was a team of people, and the person who owns the patent is Thomas Edison. He's the person whose name is signed on the thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so he gets attributed with it. And I just thought that was so interesting um, just to know that there are so many different patented parts to a light bulb. And I don't even think Thomas Edison owns all the patents to every part of the light bulb. I think he just owns most of them. But just like that illumination, I, you know, we live in this world where it's like, oh, we're individual and we have to do it by ourselves and solopreneur and, you know, I have to do it. It's like, yeah, you actually need more people yeah. to participate with you so that the vision you have can be realized. And so, um, you know, just with the light bulb, you know, being from New Jersey, uh, using light bulbs literally every moment of my life uh, and then having that awareness and that interest in the team of people that created the light bulb, I just wanted to share that with kids because kids especially, they become susceptible to the idea that they have to do things by themselves. And the truth Mm. is, is that your friends and your colleagues and your family are here to help you uh, to create the thing that you were put in this world to offer. Awesome. Aunt Lindsay, just dropping some knowledge. I love it. <laughs> I just, I, I was, that was great. I'm even like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know Thomas said this. I was, I was one of those people that was very confused about that. And so I'm, thank you for setting me straight. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm glad that was great. So obviously this is Shades of Entrepreneurship. So let's talk a little bit about business here. So the Fab Lab, 
you said, you know, recently you kind of been transitioning kind of into that business uh, realm. Are, are you an LLC, C Corp, S Corp? And how did you decide? Yeah, I'm still an LLC. I'm currently exploring other options as my business grows, literally like this moment. I became an LLC because it was the easiest yeah. thing to do yep. uh, four years ago when someone, the first person ever, shout out to Blue Star Donuts, uh, was like, I have a check for you. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> so I went online, uh, an old uh, colleague of mine at a company I'd worked at, literally uh, at the Mac, you know, Merck Media LLC was founded at the Mac Club. You know, thanks to my, my colleague, Tyler, literally sat me down and helped me press the buttons to figure out how to uh, register my business. Um, it was just the easiest thing to do at the time for what it is that I needed. But here we are almost five years uh, on the other side and still getting checked. <laughs> We're still growing. Uh, and now I'm starting to think about, um, not starting to think about, I'm in the active process of what it looks like to reincorporate into something more appropriate. Nice. Now, how do you create a revenue? Do you create a revenue? Yeah. So we, sponsors and partnerships are the key way that we create revenue. Uh, we also have a, an incredible Patreon community. So our revenue mm -hmm. comes from community support of the first eight years of the show up until about last year. We were exclusively crowdfunded. I didn't have any products to sell. Uh, everything was available for free intentionally. I'm all about access, inclusion, in addition to representation. Uh, and so the community really uh, is who showed up to make sure that the show kept going. Nice. Uh, and then Patreon is the actual main form is sponsorships and partnerships, um, both local brands and major market. Mm -hmm. And then I have a book coming out in 2022. Nice. So that's really exciting. And I'm also, and I'm also working on a product line. Uh, Look so at I'm you. super excited to be introducing. Yeah. These two new streams of revenue. Yeah. What's your book and, then affiliate, and then also affiliate sales. Uh, right now the working title is the fab lab handbook. Nice. I'll make sure when it comes out, please let me know so I can let the listeners know. Now your target audience is, is kids. How do you market <clears> to your kids, <throat> to your audience? That is innovating itself every day. Initially, I was just, like I said, I started with an 11-person email list of parents I babysat for, and they did all the marketing for me. Nice. <laughs> uh, and so much of the marketing strategy, which I really didn't have for a long time, was just word of mouth, um, shareability, you know, people being in love with the mission and using it in classrooms. Now I'm definitely stepping into a more robust social media strategy. So <laughs> TikTok, of course, we uh, about Instagram this. <laughs> Reels, yep, SEO, uh, search engine optimization, you know, the classic ways that you do yeah. internet marketing, I guess, is, is what we're activated in. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, you know, looking back on everything, what advice would you give a younger Lindsay or maybe even entrepreneurs, younger entrepreneurs, what advice would you give them? Yeah, the advice I would give Lindsay specifically and the advice that I often give to a range of entrepreneurs is charge for your product sooner. Figure out what the exchange is because what you have to offer has value and your market will respond to you. One of the things that I wish I had not done is wait so long. But again, that confidence thing is something that I really struggled with. I did not think that the show was, I didn't think it looked right. I can spend probably an hour just picking apart everything that I felt was wrong with the show. And even to this day, I mean, there are probably a solid thousand hours worth of video content that has gone completely unedited or undeployed because I didn't think it was good enough. Mm. And so for me, you know, just that whole idea of put it out as soon as you can. Find an element of it to put a price on because if people will pay for it, you will know which way to grow based on what people will pay for. You know, as a person who has spent so much time perfecting things, time moves on, people move on, things grow and innovate real fast. So a way to keep up is to just allow your iterations to be messy, allow yourself to risk failure, yeah. allow yourself to be, you know, possibly embarrassed uh, or whatever it is, because people don't remember those things. Whatever mistake you made, whatever failures you had, the next success is the only thing they are paying attention to. Yeah. You are living in your head and letting anxiety control whether or not you take the next step and truly you just have to take that next step because at a certain point that cobblestone is going to drop right from under you and you're going to have to jump. And, you know, when you have momentum and when you have the clarity of what people are responding to, and I do mean specifically what they are willing to pay for, you 
have all the information you need to make really smart steps. Nice. That is sound advice that I am, in fact, taking to heart right now because I'm just starting Amen. this podcast. So I'm, I'm, I got you, Aunt Lindsay. You're dropping some knowledge on me today. Amen. Now, now tell the Amen. folks. At, <laughs> now let's let's tell the folks at home your social media channels, your YouTube channels. How can they find you? How can they follow you on Instagram? How can they follow you on Twitter? Let the world know how yeah. to get in contact. So the, the fablab.com will send you everywhere. There is only one. The fablab.com. P A T F A B. LAB.com, the hub for absolutely everything. My YouTube and Instagram are uh, the Fab Lab HQ, the Fab Lab headquarters, the Fab Lab HQ. And on TikTok, I think I'm just the Fab Lab, but there's nothing up there yet. So don't worry about that. <laughs> Get some dance videos up there. We're waiting. We're waiting. Yeah, I can't wait. I know. I know. And then on, on Twitter, you know, because there really are not any kids on Twitter, I'm just mm-hmm. Aunt Lindsay, A U N T L I N D S E Y. Perfect. Aunt Lindsay the founder of the fab lab thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship for more information please follow the shades of e on twitter instagram facebook or visit the shades of e.com